take two experiences. One that seems to be me. For instance, the tingling sensation called the face. And two, one that seems to be not me. For instance, the sound of the children. Or the sound of the traffic. See clearly that based on the current experience alone, apart from the labels that thought attaches to the two experiences, there is no way of knowing that one is me and the other not me. Put the two experiences in front of you, so to speak. One, the tingling called the face. Two, the sound of children and traffic. See that without the superimposition of thought, we do not even know that it is a face or children, or traffic. Even less that they are me or not me. In fact, even to call them two experiences is a superimposition of thinking. Without the superimposition of thought, Experience is one seamless, ever-present totality with no parts, no entities, no objects, no time, no place ever actually experienced. All these objects, entities, time, space, they are all concepts superimposed onto the reality of experience. The reality of experience itself is one ever-present seamless whole. Nothing is closer to or farther from experiencing than anything else. Nothing is made out of anything other than experiencing. Experiencing is the only substance present in any experience. And the nature of that experiencing is knowing, being, and peace. Has experiencing ever taken place at a time that is not now? or at a place that is not here. Not now a moment in time, but now this timeless ever-presence. And not here a point in space, but here this dimensionless space of awareness.
could experience ever take place anywhere other than now and here. Do we have any knowledge or experience of anything that is not now and here? Time is made out of everything that is not now, that is the past and the future. But no such time is ever experienced. And space is made out of everything that is not here. But all experience is here, there is no experience of space. Space is an inference, the imagined distance between imagined objects. Time is the imagined duration between imagined events. In reality, experience is always now, ever-present now. In order to conceive of objects, others, entities, the world, time, space, duration, causation, we first have to forget the knowing of our own being, forget the awareness of our self as awareness, and imagine ourself instead to be a separate entity, a located, limited person. With that thought alone, the outside world of others and objects springs into apparent existence. And from that moment on, we seem to move around in the world of time and space. We seem to be born, to evolve, to grow old and to die. That is true only from the imagined point of view of the imagined separate entity. From the point of view of pure experiencing itself, which is the only valid point of view. There is no such experience of birth and death, time, space, becoming. There is, from the point of view of experiencing only itself, ever present, made of knowing, being and happiness. Never knowing anything other than itself. If this ever seems not to be the case, just go to the current experience. Thoughts, images, sensations, perceptions. See that all seeming things are intimately one with experiencing, or I. Everything equally close, equally intimate. See that without the superimposition of thought, there is just one eternal experience. It knows no other and is therefore known as love. It knows no agitation and is therefore known as peace. And it knows no lack and is therefore known as happiness. It is also known as I.
think I've had the understanding or the recognition before that the body is, uh, or, or this body is uh, a vibration. But what was interesting was on the break, I held hands with a friend here, and there was also the understanding or the recognition that there are no separate bodies. It's and when, if you, if you go to apparently touch another body, it's a, there's a merging of vibration. It's a, just one, not, not, a, not separate bodies. One awareness, the, 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 the sort of the, the image of the body falls away. Just this oneness. Yeah. Which is, you know, I mean, the, the understanding that, that this body is a vibration, but that just this all oneness and no real separation yes. in, in terms of yes. body. That, that's very true. At some stage this morning, we, we felt the, the so-called body resting on the floor or chair mm-hmm. and, and realized that, that, in fact, that experience is not composed of two objects, a body and a chair. Mm-hmm. It's just one sensation. Mm-hmm. that thought will later divide into two parts, one called me, the body, and one called not me, the mm-hmm. chair. But actually the experience itself is just one experience. Mm-hmm. You, and as you rightly say, you have that ex- exact same experience if you're holding hands with someone or in an intimate embrace with someone. It's one sensation. It's one, one experience. One vibration. One vibration that thought conceptualizes into me and the other. Yeah. But the experience itself is always one. In fact, all experience mm. is always one. Mm. Now, just take what you've just realized mm. about one body touching another body and realizing it's one vibration, yes. It's not this body, me, touching that body, them, and, and merging, yes. It's, the sensation is, the experience is one experience. Now, go back to what we did earlier and look at the current, the current view that you are seeing and trace your way back to whatever it is that is seeing. Yes? Mm-hmm. And w- we can't name that. Yes? Mm-hmm. If we wanted to name it, we would say it was empty, aware. Okay. Now, in exactly the same way that your experience that you described was not one object holding another object, it was one experience. See that the current experience is not this emptiness here and this fullness there, one touching the other. This emptiness here and this fullness here are like the two hands. It's one experience. It's not divided into emptiness and fullness, into me and not me, into subject and object awareness and its contents. Experience is always one. And if we look at experience from the inside, it is empty. If we look at it from the outside, it is full. But it's always one experience. It's not divided into parts. It's not essentially divided into one part that does the experiencing and another part that is experienced. Mm -hmm. So over over time then, Rupert, is it such that 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 starts to kind of become more uh, the norm, so to speak? Because I guess in my experience, what it's it's like most often is that uh, there's the, uh, that the, object is in the foreground and awareness is sort of in the background. But I have sort of had the experience where uh, awareness is more in the foreground and objects are in the background. Yes. Th- that's... So yes, th- so the first stage, 
let's go to our TV analogy. The first stage, we, we see the image first. And then a friend points out to us, no, it, it's not an image, it's all just the screen. And, and we realize, oh yes, the screen is in the background all the time. Mm -hmm. So then we start to pay attention to the screen more than the image. And after a while, we see the screen first mm -hmm. and the image mm -hmm. second. Mm -hmm. So as you say, the screen seems then to be in the foreground, the mm -hmm. first thing we know, mm -hmm. and the image seems to be in the background. Mm -hmm. So in the analogy, awareness, as you say, seems first to be in the background of objects, then awareness seems to come to the foreground, and we see the awareness before the objects. But then the screen and the image completely dissolve into one another. We can no longer say that the screen is either in the background or in the foreground, because to say that the screen is in the foreground is still to subtly separate the screen from the image. Yes, I so first awareness is in the background, objects are in the foreground. Mm. Then awareness is in the foreground, and mm. aware objects are in the background. And then the distinction between the two collapses. Mm. And we realize that experience is awareness. Awareness is experience. And that experience, uh, let's write it all as one word, awareness experience, written without any gaps. Awareness experience is always one seamless, intimate whole. Seamless, that is, it cannot be divided it up into parts. Therefore, it is whole. It is always whole. And it is intimate because it, it is not intimate with myself, because there is no myself for it to be intimate with. But it is just, it is made out of intimacy. Mm. That is, it is made out of love. There is no, there are not two things there, one relating to the other. Mm -hmm. So, to go back to the previous conversation, we can first trace our way back from the fullness of experience to the emptiness behind. But then at a certain point, the emptiness behind it's as if it floods the fullness in the front. So it's no longer emptiness behind. It's, it's all of this, which means all of experience, fills up that emptiness that I am. In other words, this becomes myself. This is myself. I am the totality of my experience. There is just experience, one seamless, intimate whole. And if we try to touch the stuff that his experience is made of, we just find mm. this luminous, empty, dimensionless presence. Mm -hmm. It finds itself. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what the experience of love or beauty is. The, the absolute absence of others and objects. In other words, it is when there are not two things. Mm. Ah, Dvaita, no subject and no object. That's what the experience of love is in relation to others and in relation to objects. We call it beauty, but it's the same experience. It is the collapse of the apparent subject and object of experience. Mm. Mm. Yes, it, 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 it normalizes in the end. It becomes normal. Th that there, we may still, from time to time, there may be the old impulse to separate oneself out from this seamless intimacy of experience into a, a knowing subject. But that's the tendency to do that is immediately met with our deeper understanding and it just, it collapses. And so that tendency just shows up less and less. And if it does show up, it no longer has any sustaining power. It doesn't last long. It doesn't then initiate a series of activities or relationships because it's just seen to be not true and 
it dissolves. So living in sort of beauty and love becomes the norm. Yes. And you talked yesterday about normal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the new normal. It's the new normal, okay. Yeah. It's like purple is the new black, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it becomes the new norm. It's it's the new norm, but it you know I guess it's still very it's still mind blowing. It's still uh, well, it's extraordinary or mind blowing in reference to the old norm. Yes, but in time we begin to forget the old, the old norm, norm more and more and more and more. Yes, it and. This new, extraordinary, mind-blowing experience becomes the new norm. Then, when you look back on the old norm, if you can remember what it was like, that becomes extraordinary. Yes. Yes. You, you, you look back on, on what you used to think of as normal life, and you think, I mean, imagine living like that. No. The experience of seeing doesn't take place anywhere. Yes. In other words, it doesn't take place in space. That's what you said previously. Yes, that's true. How much space does something that doesn't take place in space take up? <laughs> no, it doesn't take up any space. No. no. So all of this, yeah. what you've just said, you realize what you've just said. Yeah. All of this is made out of something which has no dimensions. Yeah. That's what you just said based on your experience. Yeah, that's true. That's right. No dimensions. Yeah. This three-dimensional world is an appearance in and of something that itself has no dimensions. And, and that's, I, you, you've come to that from your experience. You haven't thought that out. You just said, all I know of the world I mean, we, we also know hearing, tasting, touching, but let's just stick to seeing for the moment, because your question was about seeing. All I know of the visual world is the experience of seeing. Without seeing, we would know nothing of a visual world. That seeing doesn't take place in a place. place. All places are made out of it. Right. All places take place in it. It doesn't take place in a place. Yes. Yes. In fact, we can't even talk of all places taking place in it because there is no inside of something that has no dimensions. Yeah. We, we just cannot go there with thought. We cannot think about it. You can only think yeah. about something that has dimensions. Yeah. Uh, and I try to think about it. I know that. Well, it's good to try to think about it mm -hmm. because we, we, we use thought to, to bring us closer and closer and closer to our experience. But when we go to the heart of experience, thought has to stay outside. It can't come in with us. So just explore that when you're when you're walking around. First of all when you're stationary like this, but when you're walking around in nature. Just say to yourself, all I know of this visual world is the experience of seeing. That experience of, of seeing is not taking place in a place, because all places are just made of that. And that is myself. That out of which seeing is made is myself. Self. Right. That we do our best to describe when we say it is dimensionless. It is luminous in the sense that it, is, it illuminates experience. Mm -hmm. It is empty. It's not made of an object. The, these are all words that try to describe this that cannot be described. Right. So I, I'm now just formulating intellectually yes. something that is experienced. So it's fine to, to use this rational approach, but what's important is that you use thought in this way to take you back to the actual experience. experience. And then leave the thought 
-hmm. as you're walking in nature. Leave the thought mm -hmm. and just stay with the experience. Right. And then when the world seems to jump outside again, use thought to bring you back to the actual experience. experience. Well, when you feel comfortable doing that, then add sound. Where does hearing take place? Yeah, to begin I've done with, that, your, yeah. your thought will tell you it's taking place over there. Yeah. The dog is barking a hundred meters away. Right. But all you know of the barking dog is the experience of hearing. Mm -hmm. Does hearing take place a hundred meters away from yourself? I mean, how far from you now is the experience of hearing taking place? It's it's exactly not. Yeah. It's in the same placeless place, place and Absolutely. it's made of the same. Stuffless stuff. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I find hearing easier. Yes, and, yes. And touch. The hearing, yeah. Hearing. Than the visual. Yes. Yeah. Visual is, is most difficult, but, but it's good to... So you go with one of the senses, then you add another, and then add another, and then add another, and add all the senses, mm -hmm. then add your bodily sensation. Mm -hmm. And then add your thoughts and your images, right. so that it's the totality of experience. experience. And then instead of calling it seeing, hearing, thinking, etc., just call it experiencing. Right. It's just experiencing, one right. seamless, intimate whole, right. made out of this dimensionless, luminous presence. That's it. That's experience. Yeah. And uh, I had the thought, too, that thought it's not mine. It's occurring in the same space. It's yeah. the and, and made out of the oh, same was, dimensionless stuff. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I, I should say, it wasn't the thought, it was the experience. It was like seeing if it, that... If it wasn't? Uh, it was the experience. It was seeing the thought arising in that space. The same space as the feel, as the... Yes, yeah, yes. As the thought, thought is exactly. Thinking takes place in the same placeless place, yes. made out of the same dimensionless stuff. But thinking has the ability to conceptualize something that is other than that dimensionless presence. Yes, yes. Thought has the ability to rise, made only of this dimensionless presence, and as it were, turn its back on its reality. And to look in the other direction, that is to conceptualize an object right. out there, there, known by a subject in here. here. Right. That's all done by thought. And then we become so accustomed to thinking that, that we then feel that. And this feeling is, is um, supported by the body. body. This feeling seems to go into the body. So I not only believe that experience is divided into a subject and, not, and an object, but more importantly, I feel it. And hence, I feel I am a solid, dense, dense. located entity made right. out of the body, sitting on a chair, right. a fragment in space. Right, yeah. We uh, recognize, or I recognize, that awareness is unlimited and boundaryless, um, ever-present. Um, but the word unlimited, I've, I've, my understanding in, that I'm thinking of unlimited in terms of awareness and, and in my experience is that it's boundaryless. But I also hear it unlimited used in other sort of, so is it like all power? Or are you talking about unlimited as well in terms of ability or or something like that uh, my experience Ye is yes. boundaryless but yes uh, unlimited in every way but but even the word unlimited is not quite right it's not really true unlimited and ever present they're not quite true when we say awareness is unlimited that statement is made as a concession and in reference to the belief that objects are limited, that there are real things called limited objects. Now the teaching, as a concession to that belief, in order to meet us where we are, the teaching says, okay, I understand that you think there are real things called limited objects. In reference to that belief, see that what you are is the 
awareness that knows those limited objects and that that awareness itself is not made of an object and therefore is unlimited. Yes. So then we say awareness is unlimited or infinite. And the same, that it, that it is ever-present as opposed to objects which seem to come and go. However, that's only a halfway stage. If we actually explore the limited objects, the, these objects that we think of as being limited, we never actually find them. If we explore experience, all we find is consciousness. Yeah. And who is it that finds consciousness? There is only consciousness there to know consciousness. Yeah. So if we really explore experience, we don't find a collection of limited objects that appear and disappear. And therefore, we cannot define the reality of experience in terms of those limited temporary objects. We can no longer say reality is not limited and it is ever present, because what are these limited temporary objects we are comparing reality to? We've just acknowledged that we never find them. We can no longer use them as a referent. So then we can no longer even say that awareness is infinite and eternal. It is beyond being limited or unlimited. Okay. And, and, and we simply can't go there. We can't name that. <laughs> but if there is only awareness, if, all, if the entire content of experience is made out of awareness or consciousness, the word awareness itself no longer means anything mm -hmm. because awareness only means something yes. in reference to objects. Right. It's not this object. I am the awareness that knows it. Yes. So as long as we think there are objects, we think there is awareness. Right. right. Okay. Now you get rid of the objects. For a while we still call it awareness, but then you think, well, what, why call it awareness? Right. Awareness means something only in reference to something else, and there isn't something else. That is why this teaching is called non-duality. It's not called oneness. It's more accurate simply to say it's not two. Because as soon as we say it is one, it is awareness, it is actually more dualistic to call it oneness. It's, it's, more, it's more humble and more intelligent, just to say, with the mind, we can only say it's not two. We can only say what it's not. We can't say what it is with the mind. That there's huge wisdom just in that phrase. It's not two. It's the best the mind can do. The mind can't trespass into that, into reality. It can't say, although the mind is made out of it, it cannot say a single word that is true about it. And that is why, if we use thinking, if we truly use the mind to explore our experience, and we go all the way with the mind, the mind will bring itself to its own end. That, that's why we enjoy thinking in this. We don't stigmatize thinking. We understand, of course, the reality cannot be expressed by thought, although thought is made out of it. But we don't therefore say, okay, don't think, don't ask questions. No, we take thinking all the way so that when thinking eventually comes up, up to, to reality, to touch reality, it, it dies like the moth in the flame. It, it, it becomes the flame that it was thinking about. And that, that is an effortless cessation of the mind. It's not a disciplined sensation, cessation of the mind. It's not a mind that has been trying to control itself, thinking that it shouldn't ask questions or meditating in order to make it more peaceful. It's a, a mind that naturally and effortlessly comes to an end. Life then becomes a, a celebration of the understanding. Exactly. And 
all that remains to do from then on is simply to use the body mind that you have temporarily been given mm -hmm. to to celebrate mm -hmm. to express to share to communicate in whatever unique way your particular body mind is, is inclined to do.